everybody, and welcome to Sonic Talk, episode 495, recording today live on Wednesday the 14th of June. Uh, we are a podcast that talks all things to do with music technology, music production, software, synthesizers, drum machines, all that kind of stuff, iOS stuff, Macs, PCs, all of that kind of business. And I uh, want to say hello and welcome to everybody. Uh, we've got, I managed to get the YouTube chat working just in time for the these rather lonely ladies who seem to be uh, hanging out there. Uh, I'm not sure that they're genuine, but uh, they're obviously looking for some company in some way. Uh, I've tried blocking them, but they keep coming back. So they're obviously quite clever lonely ladies as well so uh maybe that's in the youtube chat room we've also got our uh our usual irc chat which doesn't seem to be full of lonely ladies it's full of our usual viewers so uh welcome everybody uh thank you very much for joining us and also i want to say uh, if you're interested in winning a copy of isotopes uh rx6 we've got a competition as we had last week we'll be announcing a winner from last week and they've got another copy of rx6 the audio restoration system to give away so some some good things to those who come and wait. I think I said that right. Anyway, if you if this is your first time, please do subscribe to the channel. We not only got uh, this Sonic Talk podcast, we do uh, equipment reviews, interviews, all of that kind of thing. In fact, coming up at the weekend, we've got uh, Cymru Beats, which is a modular meet based in Cardiff. We're going to be going there. We're going to be streaming live via our YouTube channel uh, the uh, performances from that evening's uh, bands. And so you should check those out. That's uh, Mylar Melodies, who you might know. He's the guy who does who's done a lot of really great modular stuff on YouTube. Nigel Milani and Ian Body, Martin Dubka, Wisdom Water, Dr. John Bidolf. One of them, I can't remember which one, is uh, under contract, so can't be live streamed. But uh, maybe if you just hang around, you'll find out. If you if that question, if that if those are thought of questions that fascinate you, you could watch everything else around it and deduce which one isn't. If that makes any sense. Anyway, let's say hello to a few guests. We've got uh, we've got Mr. Mark Tinley. Mark Tinley, Sonus Magus, Magus.com. He's based in Glastonbury, which I imagine at the moment is filling up with uh, revelers as Glastonbury approaches, because I think it's next weekend. Glastonbury Festival is what five or six miles, three or four miles away from the town centre. I can't remember which. Seven Magic Seven. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Um, it is. It's filling up with men with uh, neat haircuts and. Clean flip-flops, clean feet as well, which is kind of weird. Bare feet people in Glastonbury, you know, the real bare feet people, have dirty toenails and stuff. Right. So these very polished young men are wandering the streets and telling everybody they know everything, which is kind of annoying, actually. Well, to be honest, you can you can stay smug in the uh, knowledge that after a couple of days actually at said festival, they will no longer be uh, clean, li- clean and with clean toenails and knowing everything. They will be empty yep. husks of human beings <laughs> with big smiles out. on their faces, hopefully. Yeah, burned out by, by uh, all the wrong cider and other things. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that sounds like fun. I mean, this must be a yearly occurrence. You must be used to this by now. I mean, I don't need that. What is it? I'm actually going to go on Sunday. We've got a Sunday ticket, so wow. uh, which you can get if you're a local person. The idea of going for two days fills me with dread, but the idea of uh, getting up on the mor- in the morning, walking round the corner to the town hall and getting on an old sharabang and being delivered to the centre of the festivities and then being picked up and brought home again afterwards uh, seemed like a good idea because it's the last year that our son can get in for free because he's 12 this year, I think, so under 12s free so we thought we'd better take him oh that sounds like a great fun i that's that's what i was trying to do i was trying to hook up with rich to see if there was a way but it's all sewn up so it's very sewn up so yeah. you know as i understand i mean these things are but you know what is it Hundred and seventy thousand people they're expecting which is an insane number of people to be in a field or so great if every single one of them came in my shop and spent a pound wouldn't it <laughs> i would uh i would stick with you know two or three percent of those well just one yeah. half a percent frankly would probably be fine and spending i'll you know, be all right with one person actually if one person comes in and says i saw your podcast ah uh, it was great uh can i buy that thing for a pound i'll be very happy so why don't you i'll tell you what you should do is maybe stock up on wellington boots and umbrellas and bin liners just just you know just people do of- actually and the, the cost of wellington boots has gone to about one and a half to two times what it was about three weeks ago so they put the price up as well it's the free market economy folks i know it is <laughs> Excellent. And there's, there's men wandering around looking for wallets how would you come to glastonbury without a wallet that's a weird thing isn't it why would you even need a wallet the money's not going to stay know. in there for long but they must have thought so. i'll leave my wallet at home so i can be nice and safe and then they've got here and thought oh no i feel a bit lost without my wallet i'd better go and buy a new one <laughs> very odd well glastonbury is famed for its uh 
wallets? No, I have actually have absolutely no Ooh, idea whether that's might true. Might show you something later. You, okay. I'll stop talking. Sorry. All right. Okay. Well, anyway, Mark, thank you. Lovely to have you as ever. Um, and the other chuckling that you hear in the background is Mr. Charles Chicky Reeves, who's there yes. at SublimeUK.com, uh, producer, bass player, not bass player, producer. I, I you might, you might play bass. Yeah, well, I, uh, I actually am a session bass player, yeah. So, oh, wow. Okay. Well, there you go. I'll add that to your string. Uh, composer, uh, front of house guy, you are obviously preparing to do some Howard Jones gigs and head off into the uh, the festival dust to do your own thing yes. in fact me and charles met for the first time physically which was really weird on sunday because uh, on sunday i played at the synthesis event which is the sort of first inaugural uh, i'm hoping it's the inaugural and there'll be more um synth event uh, organised by Simon Forsyth who's a great synthesizer collector top chap and uh, it was at the Printworks in Hastings and it was a really good day I played I was on first because my stuff's kind of ambient and noodly and then there was Battery Operatical Orchestra who were also particularly brilliant uh, Vile Electros and Native Ray who were a couple of young lads who were also really good it was actually an or, all of them, almost well, everybody there was just really nice, and I had a wonderful time. Although I did have a hangover on Monday as I drove back, and that's just the way it goes. But I also, um, and then last night, I went to uh, see Craftwork in Birmingham uh, Symphony Hall, which mm. is the first time I've seen them. And uh, I figured, you know, because Ty had a ticket going, and I thought, right, I've got to take this opportunity, even though it's been a crazy week. And I went to see them, and uh, uh, first of all, the sound was amazing. That place sounds absolutely fantastic it's a symphony hall with adjustable reverb so they've designed it so that they can baffle it or unbaffle it depending on the kind of music so obviously they had it damped down and the frequency response was awesome there was no reverb even down into the low end and they were they they played it was you know very punchy and it was a flown system and i feel a little bit kind of sometimes i feel a bit um, disappointed by those but then they got to man machine and they turned it up so loud that Things were shaking and it was starting to hurt, which, it, which you know, is the sort of thing that I used to enjoy about about it. But when I actually experienced it, I thought, Christ, that is so loud. And it was it was brilliant, but I'm glad they only sort of peaked and then they dropped it down a yeah. little bit. But it was it was amazing. I've never heard a flown system sound that loud and that... I mean, it sounded good. It was just really kind of like uh, pinned you to the wall, but it was awesome. We all sat there with our 3D specs. And uh, yeah, and uh, nice to see Ty. Unfortunately, he can't make it today. But uh, but I learned a lot about craftwork that day. Mm. Uh, have you seen craftwork, uh, Charles? I have. Um, in fact, I had kind of gotten out of doing um, doing live work, and it was just focused on the studio for a while. And <clears throat> I was coaxed out of retirement from that because someone had seen a one-off show that I actually mixed of craftwork. <laughs> It was in uh, in New York, so they 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 found me, and then I, they hired me to start working with Grace Jones because there's a strong Grace Jones and Kraftwerk connection there. So that's how I got the Grace Jones gig. Ah, wow! I bet that I didn't know you. God, you work for everybody, Charles. Yeah. How was that? I, I I'd like to find out. I mean, I'm guessing if you're working with Grace Jones, the concept of a virtual sound check is absolutely essential, right? Because she's yes. legendarily poor at her timekeeping, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that's why I started uh, using Avid consoles because I, I was recording every show in Pro Tools anyway. So I would just I would track the previous show, and then whenever we pull into a place like the Roundhouse or something like that, you know, where you really need a sound check, uh, that was about the only way to get a sound check. So <laughs> yeah, that that was fun. It was fun doing that doing that tour with her. Uh, she's such she's great live. She's really great. Live. Yeah, I mean, it's rare to see someone with such. That there are there are some performers who command attention and they hold the stage completely. And she is one of. Them. I remember. I think the last time I saw her do anything live, it was at the Queen's birthday or something. And it, I just thought that's got to be one of the most risky bookings ever. Because mm. you know, if you're late, it's all televised live. You know, I wonder if they had someone basically just kind of you know <laughs> attached to her at, whole, at all times. Say right now, you're going on. No, you can't go and do this. You can't go and do that. I, I mean, I don't know how she is or whether it's a. Uh, because I mean, it, the, the reputation is deserved. <laughs> yeah, but part, I, I mean, part of it, I think, part of it is probably due to the fact that it it it, it enhances her diva-like status, and it's the sort of thing that somebody may do just to kind of com- make the reputation justified. And you know, it could be a showbiz thing, or it could be just a completely out of it, and I don't know what's going on, and I don't care about anything else. But you know, I like to think that it's professionally done to just before it gets to be a real problem. But you, you know. I, I'm not asking you to tell tales, Charles. But no, no. Uh, well, I mean, like, uh, 
I, I did. Uh, well, there's a show. Um, there's actually one particular show that we did that I have talked about uh, at Pro Sound Muse Awards, and they, whenever they invite me back, they want me to tell the same story again because the audience apparently loves it. I won't go into it here, but but she played. She went on quite late once in Russia, and it was <laughs> it was it was a scary situation because it was an oligarch's private party. Oh yeah, you don't mess with those kind of people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was so that was, so like, <clears throat> the the quote from that day is. You can tell Miss Grace Jones she can go sing, or I send someone to break her legs. I don't care which. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Was that re- was that relayed through you as you're the guy in the front of the house? Yeah, I was. I was standing outside her dressing room. He told me. I told her <laughs> we went on stage. <laughs> I ran out. It was. It was a like a corporate sort of gig, you know. So it was just her and a backing track that I was running off Ableton Live, and uh, and yeah. So I just went out there, started the music. She got on stage, started performing. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that I have got to meet you for a drink and uh, <laughs> quiz you more on that. That sounds like a brilliant story. I uh, got stories I, about her, about Prince, about everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, you know, saving it for the book, I'd imagine, right? That's right. <laughs> I, I, and I never signed a non disclosure agreement, so it's okay. But I, I, I don't, I won't say anything bad about anybody. But no, <laughs> I, just, you're not that kind of guy. No, but no, anyway, no. it was a lot of fun uh, at the weekend, and uh, uh, and I enjoyed playing the gig. I, I would say the one thing that I have realised is the amount of work that goes into doing one offs like every six months. Months. I really need to get my my stuff together so that it's not quite so uh, torturous to get prepped and ready for such a thing. So I'm going to work on that. Right. Um, oh, there's stuff, isn't there? Okay. Here we go. Let's start with some things. This is, of course. That isn't someone with very large hands or a cut-down roly. Well, it is a cut-down roly. This is the roly uh, Seaboard Block, which is a two-octave version of the Seaboard technology. I mean, I know they seem to be monopolising the news because Rich was talking about it the other day, but this just happened to come out this week, and I think we've got to talk about it. That looks like um, a Parisi finger right there. I won't play it all. But this is obviously the news that the new Roly Block uh, seaboard has come out. And for starters, it's smaller. Uh, it's a two-octave thing. It's uh, about th- 280 quid. So, you know, it's still expensive. But for the seaboard technology, which uh, traditionally has been very expensive, and as as you know, some people love it, some people hate it, but uh, this is now out there in the world. And it seems like a very smart move to me because those of you uh, who perhaps have been thinking about it but just couldn't possibly justify the expense, it's now become something that might be you something you might consider i don't know mark are you the sort of guy that would uh, be interested in something like this does it make it more attractive to you well that it's got smaller and, and cheaper yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> and that i can make my own little blocks up uh does that appeal to me yes <laughs> excellent so uh, i oh at that price i think it has to be on my shopping list because that's really? uh, okay it's cheap isn't it 279 yeah, well, I mean, cheap in relative terms. I mean, bear in mind there are no moving parts on it whatsoever. But yes, I mean, yes. But it's an access to that particular little world of like being able to move your finger around and control things in a special way. So I don't know. I think it. Uh, I I think I should stock one, don't you? If I stock, oh, one, that's a good if idea. I don't like it. I can always sell it to somebody. How that, about that? That is a, a, a tremendous idea, and one of the advantages of being a man in your position at SonusMakers dot com, as I might oh, say. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there we go. Just down there, the 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 address of Mark's store. Yeah, I, I, I'm. A, what was really interesting is because the the the, the sort of uh, default reaction to mini keys, which is effectively what we're looking at here, is oh no, not again. Who needs that rubbish? And I, uh, there was a chap who commented on our site actually. Really? And he, he and he said that, and I said actually, because I've got the uh, or I've had the Roly Seaboard full size, which you know it, it is a different experience, but it's actually quite large, and I find it really quite difficult to play because you're make, you're doing these kind of movements, which are very tiring if you're not an accomplished keyboard player, which I am not. So the fact that it's smaller means that you can get quite. I think you can get quite a lot more expression and gesture out of it without having to kind of. Do yeah. this with your fingers all the time, and I think that actually could be a key to sort of unlocking the potential of something like this to a wider audience. I don't know what you think, uh, Charles. I, 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 I can't. I forget whether you're a, a, a roly person or whether you've uh, experienced it, or whether it kind of this is the sort of thing that appeals to you, or whether you because a lot of people just go, "Oh God, I, I can't be bothered to learn 
to invest that much time in something like this, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, this is at a price point. I would definitely do it. Uh, the thing that excites me the most, though, is not that. It's the light block. You know, because I, I use, uh, like, the chaos pad. I use it quite a lot live in, in the studio. And I like the whole XY, you know, light up function of that. So I would probably get, yeah, like, four of those and make a giant block out of it. Um, but the, just the actual, really, the keyboard part, the small one, it's at a price point. I would probably get it, though. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think, you know, again, you know, without dwelling on it, because Roly do a lot of marketing and I'm not trying to become their marketing department by any stretch. Um, uh, there was another thing that, that we published last week, actually. Ed, uh, our modular specialist, he did uh, the Endorphins uh, ES, uh, the Endorphins shuttle system, which is a kind of uh, a, a single uh, unit uh, co um, compact uh, pre-made kind of modular system and it's got a USB host on it and he plugged in the blocks and was using that for modulation stuff and that's and it was like oh because up to now it's been like yeah whatever I mean I don't really want to control an iOS app and that's it I mean but because you can spit it out to the USB and then route that into all sorts of uh, CV routings or what have you it starts to in terms of the modular world it starts to get really very interesting so it's it it started out almost like a, a running joke, doesn't it? Because it was a very expensive. Then blocks were like, "Yeah, who's that for?" And now it's starting. Maybe people are starting to see that there's potential there, and it may well uh, start to fulfil more of a purpose. And that's quite interesting, isn't it? The way that that curve you get with a product, where you know the realization that it might be useful. Uh, you know, I, it's got to be rewarding if you're the company, because obviously people buy the stuff. But it must be nice that finally people may be getting it. I don't know if they are or not. That's obviously. A bit premature to say, but oops, that's not you, is it? That's you. <laughs> <laughs> I look very flowery. Today. I'm a sunflower. Oh, yeah. I, I am. I'm really excited about the light block thing, and I, I like the 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 connectivity of it. You know, the the, the magnets and the uh, USB C stuff. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I would. I, don't, I honestly don't think I'd get involved in the app part of it at all. I would just use it as a as yet another controller. I mean, I've got a lot of controllers around here, <laughs> and so I probably don't need anything like that. But but I really I do want something right now. When I when I go live, I always take um, the Teenage Engineering OP One. I take that as a as just a controller for all my effects. And I would I'd like to take something. I mean, I know that's really small, but I'd like to take something smaller and less expensive because <laughs> that thing's like six seven hundred pounds. Yeah. So I, I'd rather take if I could just do it all using just a light block. I'd be I'd be very happy with that because what I'm doing is I, I'm always triggering you know like snare splashes and certain vocal delays and things like that and it's all going into Ableton Live and stuff like that so I I need a a good small non keyboard type controller that so I could you could use for gesture I guess that yeah. would make sense to you Mark as well I mean gesture is something that's kind of very useful I mean I don't know if you, you... know why I say this what if you look at the dimensions of it it says it's um, eleven inches long and uh, five and a half inches wide. So I see that on my guitar. Okay. Glued oh. to the front of my guitar. Right. Underneath, underneath where I play. So where the controls and the scratch plate usually are on, the, on a Les Paul, you just stick it along the bottom of the guitar. Then I can play the guitar, I can sustain notes, and then I can do things with that. That could be really cool. That's interesting. I mean, that's similar to um, was it Muse who put a chaos pad in uh, in there or some kind of X Y controller yeah. in one of theirs? But, and I guess that I, I don't know what that does. Control maybe loopers in Ableton. I, I don't know what it does, but you know that's a similar kind of concept, right? Yeah, it could be so cool on the front of a guitar. I have to try those. Definitely. Yeah. Well, maybe you should uh, apply for uh, getting getting them down to the store, and then you can try them out. I will. As they can come in as long as they don't wear flip flops. <laughs> <laughs> and a young couple came in today and they said, oh, oh, are you open? I said, yes, of course, come in. And I said, but don't say the word Glasto or I'm going to kick you out. And they looked horrified. <laughs> really? So are you becoming it's the kind Glastonbury. of... Glastonbury. We live in Glastonbury. Legendarily uh, grumpy shopkeeper. Is that kind of... Uh, are you finding a new role for yourself there? Uh, quite possibly, yeah. I think I... Do I've, you think people uh, will just come to be insulted? It's a bit faulty towers in my shop sometimes, actually. <laughs> I've started, um, I have got this little CCTV system running. And I played, so I said to my wife, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I played her some of the footage, and she was kind of like, oh my God, did you really have that conversation with a customer? And then she said, you should put this on YouTube. Um, but I don't know what the legal 
implications of that are because if i'm a commercial enterprise and i'm filming people it's okay to do it as cctv as long as it's for my use yeah but if i start publishing it i think i open up a huge can of worms so i need to find out um how to get permission to do that from customers i suppose without telling them i'm filming it first but Just then get put a massive tnc it. above the door in tiny little writing yeah. by entering here you agree to give me basically the rights to your image in entire everything yeah <laughs> yeah don't do that mark that's no, that's bad stuff that. that's I'm bad stuff do that but i yeah. could cordon the area off with that uh you know the yellow tape oh that's a good idea so if you stand light, here not cross if you stand, if you stand here, you may well end up on YouTube if we have a meaningful conversation. <laughs> In fact, if you, I have got um, the shop has its own YouTube channel, and there is a bit of a conversation I had with this woman who came, and she played a Tunisian bagpipe, but uh, she was reluctant to tell me my, her name. But I did tell her she was going on YouTube. Um, but that conversation was fairly interesting i think um, yeah <laughs> okay right then perhaps we should move on well maybe what we'll actually do now is uh, bring in a slight message from our friends at isotope and uh, we can talk a little bit about this uh, rx this is again I, I need to find a more up-to-date video but this was the sort of teaser and trailer rx6 now at the latest iteration i mean it is a very impressive piece of audio restoration software it does a whole bunch of new things you've got better dialogue you've got d rumble uh d uh russell uh, there's a really brilliant uh spectral deesser which is actually very handy uh because it's quite hard to do DSing very well, and this deals it. A breath delim uh, eliminator, which is fantastic for cleaning up vocals, as well as all the other stuff, comes in uh, advanced, uh, standard, which is more designed for music production, and also elements, which is kind of more a suite of plugins. Uh, check it out at uh, isotope.com forward slash rx6. And I would say, as well as that, you're getting things like D clip, which, if you've got clipped audio and it's like a great take, you can deal with that and kind of. Uh, um, get rid of the analog and digital clipping actually it's a very useful thing so you can quite often rescue a number of uh, audio uh, takes that maybe you know had the beautiful spirit but there was some kind of technical issue with it well worth checking out and of course we have a competition uh, which for this week uh, well, I've gone for the hashtag restore and more which is restore and the word and and more uh, restore and more uh, as one word that's one hashtag and the hashtag rx6 doesn't matter if it's upper or lower case and if you tweet that and mention at sonic state and at isotoping then you'll be entered for the competition next week so you tweet the hashtag Restore and more, and the hashtag RX6 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. And you will be entered in the competition uh, to win a copy of RX6. And we have a winner from last week, episode 494 from last week. We have a chap called, I'm guessing it's a chap, people called Neil generally are, but I could be wrong. Uh, this is a chap called Neil Boards, at Neil Boards, spelt B O R. B-O-A-R-D-S, uh, and they tweeted, yes, please, I'd love to win this. Well, good news, Neil Boards, you have won it. So if you get in touch, we'll get the Isotope people to pop it into your account, and you can enjoy, I believe it's RX Standard, which is a, a great suite of plugins, and it's something certainly here with video, you know, quite often we've got something great, and it's like, oh, no, there's this. I mean, at the moment, they're, they're demolishing a building next door, uh, we and it was rather funny actually today because we've had an Ableton certified trainer in doing some really brilliant sort of did you know Ableton can do this so if you're playing live he brought his hardware rig in and it's all going into sort of Moto interfaces live processing of the inputs and he's showing us how to kind of set this up to kind of create a, a workable and a very highly functional live thing. And so he was deconstructing his track, and in the background they were deconstructing the building next door. So I was sort of kind of uh, joking about that, and I guess we might need to use it for the jackhammer that's been going incessantly for about two weeks. But uh, we'll see. Hopefully you won't hear it too much, but I, I would stick out for that guy called uh, Tom Lonsborough is uh, really full of brilliant tips, and we have a series of videos of that coming up sometime in the not too distant future. Uh, right, what's next? Oh yeah, you got to see this. This is one of the reasons I went down to. Uh, well, not the one of the reasons I took my camera. It's Tom Carpenter Analog Solutions. Yes. The results and the fruits of your labours. Yes, hey, that's, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, uh, new synthesizer, fuse box. Um, I'll fast forward it because we do talk a little bit about. Uh, um, spent a lot of time working on there it is. new circuits, revising old circuits. It's a big old thing. Three oscillators. Um, LFO, yeah, oscillator three can also double as an LFO, arpeggiator, uh, state variable filter, two envelopes, something called a patinator, and a transposer, and a MIDI CV interface. Let's see if I can get along to a bit where it starts to make some sound. Right, let's get into that. Played them. 
Well, take it from me, it sounded really good because <laughs> I can't find the bit where it, it did. He, he, what he did, he kicked the sub oscillator and it just went wow. And everybody went, and I was like, whoa, that's amazing. I mean, it, it was all only really being played from uh, the Patinator, which is a little uh, four step CV sequencer, but with gate eight gates. So you can create these weird polyrhythmic things. And, um, for analog solution stuff, I know Mark Doty's very keen on it, and I've never really had any time with one. I'm hoping to get one down for review. But the thing about this one is it looks like it's going to be actually really quite affordable because he's moved, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of realised that uh, some of his manufacturer techniques can be updated. So he's been working behind the scenes to kind of create something that's going to be more affordable to make and therefore more affordable to buy. I and mean, you checked this out, Chucky, didn't you? So, uh, uh, and I noticed you were there for quite a long time, right? Yeah, yeah. I, well, for one thing, he's, he's just... A uh, really top guy. I really like talking to him, um, and and that 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 machine sounds nice. It does sound nice. It's like the last thing I need is another synth. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but gosh, it does sound really good. Uh, um, and yeah, he had this cool pattern that was running, and it's just yeah, it is it is really nice. We you should get a uh, like a direct feed. Um, it's, I did it's get a direct right. feed, and I have got a direct feed, um, but it's sometimes that that doesn't always work out. I should also say Scott Nawozniak in the chat room says, as the owner of a Telemark V2, I want Fusevoc immediately. The world needs more orange synths, and I would tend to agree. I like because the Sledge is probably the only other orange one, and also there's uh, the Dave Smith Mofo was orangish as well, so you know, nice. But it, I like the fact that it's just this sort of it's big, and there's yeah. there's lots of space on it, and and I think. That's the other part of it, the fact that you've got room to sort of manoeuvre. And it, there's lots of pat- there's lots of normalised stuff, but there's lots of patching as well, and cross-mod, uh, all of those kind of things. And it, it did sound really nice. And, and, you know, I'm told by people who are uh, Analog Solutions pe- you know, fans that they just that they sound really vintage and warm and, and, and authentic. And that's something that I'm looking forward to trying out myself, definitely. I mean, nine hundred quid is where he's roughly aiming it. Plus fat, he wouldn't be. He wouldn't say definitely, but that seemed, you know, when you that's, consider they're the a boot, they, they call themselves a boutique manufacturer. That ain't bad for a three oscillator right. analog synth that size, is it? Yeah, it's it, it's it's really great, and 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 I like the fact that it's basically he, well, at least the one I was playing with, he he had made it's like that he just finished it a day before or something. <laughs> it's built it by hand. I love that kind of stuff. I absolutely love handmade stuff. But yeah, his stuff does sound amazing. It's just such good work. Such good work. Yeah, so looking forward to that. Uh, Mark, it kind of almost matches the colour of your shirt there. So, you know, maybe you should you should kind of pick up a uh, <laughs> one just so that you can have as an accessory, perhaps. I uh, could do, couldn't I? Yeah. It looks uh, £900. Sounds like a good price. It does look good. Um, definitely good in orange. I would have to try one. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's always the way, isn't it? I mean, do, is, is there is there is there a kind of is there anything you're sort of ha- currently hankering after? Because I mean, I know you more prefer to kind of discover unusual side of things and maybe modify existing stuff than uh, than buying new instruments in the electronic variety. I mean, I am generalising here, but I'm just wondering. Um, th- do you know what I'm actually? I mean, I know I've gone. Maybe this is just a breathing in and breathing out thing. I know I've gone like in the box and everything is either in a laptop or a computer. But since I've been doing this music shop thing, people have been bringing in old rack units like um, uh, like Roland D550 kind of things. And um, and I, I, I don't know. There's some, oh, I've just got a Clavier Nord rack actually come in. And uh, I've got a Novation X station. And there's something about having a chunk of hardware with uh, with knobs all over it. So maybe I'm hankering back after moving back outside the box and having some kind of world that I can use standalone away from a computer. And I know that sounds like an odd thing for me to be saying, but um, so new things that work in the real world and don't need to be connected to computers have started to interest me again. Yeah, no, I can see that. Is, you know, bigger things as well. So this is interesting, actually. I'll tell you what, I mean, one of the things that uh, was as a result of Tom coming in, and I know uh, Robbie does it, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of the bands that you do it with, the concept of having, 
you know, Ableton Live at the heart, which is sequencing external MIDI gear, which is then coming back in via external inputs and then being reprocessed yeah. and re kind of, you know, so you're getting this kind of hybrid between the worlds. And it's something, you know, now that we're getting to the point of CPUs are fast enough, uh, low, low enough latency audio interfaces, that's becoming a real reality of this sort of real time processing of this kind of stuff. And it really. That's where I'm thinking, yeah, that's maybe where the lines are blurry, you know, because you can go kind of like, I'm only going hardware sequence, I'm only going external hardware, I don't want a computer at all. But sometimes, you know, the, the benefits of, of this hybrid kind of system are, are really quite compelling in many ways. And I'm guessing, you know, Charles, you probably see this all the time because people, you know, I know Robbie does it and, you know, yep. it must make I, things... I do, I do, I like, I track stuff to tape, you know, I, like, I'll, I'll do, I mean, most of, most of what I do is electronic music and... I still track it all to tape. I used hard, hardware uh, so, uh, synths as much as possible. I do, I do use some software synths. I used the one that you guys came up with. Oh, did you? Uh, yeah, I use that quite a lot. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I love the Arturia stuff. I use that too. Um, in fact, I think because uh, this this uh, tour I'm doing this autumn, the OMD tour, they're launching a new album. I think they did a lot of that using uh, Arturia stuff. That album sounds brilliant. I know it's not out yet, but I. I've heard it, <laughs> but, but man, it does sound good. You know, I, I think I think using a bit of both is great. Absolutely love doing it. Although one thing I like do like to do, even with soft sense, is I do like to run them out. It sounds really like over the top, but I do like to run them out uh, analog. I have this old box called a, uh, it's made by ART called a DIO, and basically you go spit it out. It turns it, it runs it through a twelve x seven tube. You run it back in, runs it through the other half of the twelve x seven tube. And uh, spit if back in. So I'll just like use that as an effects loop, and just to on soft sense because I just like what it does to the sound of them. It's neat. Uh, it's neat. Well, I guess it's the other is the the mirror image of what I've just been talking about, isn't it? It's that kind of, uh, and it's becoming easier and easier to do that kind of thing. And so that that definitely makes a lot of difference. And I'm sure Mark, you know, this, in terms of oh, ramp, yeah, yeah, I was going to say there's another whole world that we lose, which we should interface with as well, which is like guitar pedals. So somebody should make a box that just interfaces all these different things. Like, um, because I used to, I used to have like a pile of stuff on the floor, and I would just think I'd make a chain of things to affect things, and I'd think, oh, what happens next? So I might go like keyboard into the DDA desk, back out the DDA desk into an H three thousand through a flanger pedal, and then back into something else, and then through a lexicon, and then back into the desk, and then I'd record that, and. I don't know. In the moment, if you start chaining real world things, it's very different to chaining plugins, and it does something very different. So, um, well, yeah, I'd imagine also there's got to be a market for something that is essentially uh, a, a kind of level matcher, so that you're not putting yeah. kind of, or you can really drive the the signal hard into a distortion pedal, or back it off to the sort of level of a signal that would be more closer to a, a guitar level so you can attenuate and because i mean in the same way that we drive filters and you, you we get that extra quack it's got to be you know you can't just plug a regular yeah. guitar pedal up i mean yeah, find a nice, there you go, there's something to hanker after then if somebody can invent a 19 inch rack mount unit with a uh, with say uh four or maybe eight channels of io which can either attenuate or boost um and it's simply like, you know, a jack and an XLR input on each one and an, a jack and an XLR output. Yeah, 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 yeah. I well. think to, to so I can switch between different things and chain anything without yeah, yeah, introducing yeah. too much noise. That would be like really cool. Charles, do, do, do radial do stuff like that, don't they? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, they, they're, they call it the guitar reamping kit. But, you know, there's also the poor man's. Oh, version, oh right. Okay. Yeah, I know what that is. The, the, what they call the poor man's version is where you, on the. On the send side, you use uh, uh, an active DI. You attenuate by 20 dB on that. On the on the uh, the other end of that, running the balance line all the way, you do a passive DI with with a 20 dB pad on that and running in reverse direction. You can't run a, an active in reverse direction, but you can run a passive in reverse direction, and that does the same same sort of thing. Yeah, it's, it, it, it just about balances everything out. It's, because it's about a it's about a forty something dB. I mean, there's a voltage difference also, but there, it's 
going from line level down to guitar Aiden's level about as well. But sometimes that sounds cool. You have to try it both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's true. I guess the thing is, is I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that one of our guitar contributors, uh, Rob Hicks, he found this. Uh, it was a patch bay. It was really simple, and it was just basically it allowed you to set up these kind of alternative routings and it was just kind of you pressed and hold one pedal and then you press another one and it meant that one went there and so you could recall these kind of routings into between multiple pedals it didn't do the attenuation but it gave you this kind of okay this then that then that then that or this then that and that and that radio and that. does that too I, I don't know if you're if you're talking about the radio one but radio no, makes a wasn't. box that does that they, they make a, a we can have all these different effects and you just press which ones and what order you want to go in and it's very cool very very cool because I use I use a lot of like guitar effects. I use like I use uh, Memory Man quite a bit. I use a Chandler Overdrive. Um, uh, I use Dyna Comp and well, MXR phase pedals, things like that. Because uh, that stuff sounds great on a mix, you know. And I just run it as an effects chain. But if you've got the attenuation right, then it, it you don't get that extra the too much suck, and you know you can be a bit more subtle about it. I suppose. Yes. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, I've just realized my camera's really dark, but it's crashed, so I can't actually uh, <laughs> make it any lighter. Uh, but while while I'm maybe figuring out that, I think what I'll do is just mention our um, Wave Junction, as Charles uh, mentioned. This this is the Wave Junction. It's a Max for Live synth that uh, we currently sell. It's a four-voice paraphonic synth, but it's got three multi-mode filters which are actually really do sound really nice it's also got five lfos five envelopes and a 12 slot modulation matrix so you can get some very complex stuff going on you need max for live obviously to run it but i have to say the filtering uh, really does sound very lovely and you've also got wavetable oscillators and the like as well and we're doing a little special on that uh, which is uh, to the end of June. Uh, if you go to uh, sonicstate.com forward slash shop slash WJ or bit.ly slash, uh, I can't remember what the blooming URL is. It, it, it said there, bit.ly slash wave junction, didn't it? Uh, if you put the code WJ1706, that's WJ1706 at the time of purchase, you get uh, an additional 10% off. I mean, it's not very expensive in the first place, but if you feel the need, please do. It helps support the site and, uh, you know, all of those good things. Who's eating crisps there? Ah, there you go, Mark. I'm kind of... <laughs> I caught you. Right. Um, well, actually, what I did th- last week, because I, I, I anticipate, because I know I was going to craft work yesterday uh, and I was also filming all day, I, I anticipate we might be a bit low on topics because, obviously, there's... With the summer. So I asked uh, on Facebook, you know, whether there anybody had any questions for the panel. And one of them, uh, a chap called uh, Tom Gladstone came up and he said, uh, it'd be great to hear stuff about controller keyboards. What's out there and how you can implement? I would like to control two synths with a, consi- con- a single controller, split the keyboard. So zoning, I guess, and have, you know, uh, uh, octave shift on zonings and different MIDI channel to higher octaves. And it's finding out hard to find out what's there. And that's really interesting because a lot of current uh, controller models are generally, you know, a bunch of controllers and a keyboard, and you need to then map the the other stuff via the DAW. So I was wondering if anybody had any suggestions for that sort of thing. Uh, I, I'd like to throw my ore into the mix. I mean, this isn't a controller keyboard, and I mentioned it before, but it's something that I use live, and this is the uh, Labs for Music Sapario, which is basically a MIDI router and MIDI patch bay, and you can have... Uh, up to eight zones with uh, two MIDI ins, two MIDI outs, and a host out, so you could hook up something like a BeatStep Pro or maybe a controller keyboard that maybe doesn't have that, and you can set up up to eight zones with velocity switching and uh, zoning and all that, and it just recalls and routes it in and out to wherever you want, and that's a really cool thing. I mean, it's a little bit on the pricey side. It's about 300 euros, I think, but it really is a super flexible, and it also sent out all the patch changes and stuff. And in terms of controller keyboard, I don't know, Charles, is there something, something that you could recommend that at least did a couple of splits mm. no yeah it's tough isn't it? i mean some of the i, I will splits say are hard yeah some of the older uh m audio the axioms the, the axioms they do that then they moved into once they got to the white ones with the axiom pro it stopped doing splits and zones but the axiom uh uh i've got one here somewhere i think it's an e- axiom air i think uh 61 of the big sort of bulky gray ones they do splits and zones and the, the keyboards are fine on those and i think the, the drivers and all that are still supported they're class compliant they're a bit of a as with all of these things they are a little bit fiddly to program and i know obviously the nectar panorama i think that does zones and splits as well so, but it's a, it's again it's kind of a higher price thing and also the brand new roland i think it's the rd 3000 is it that's got a four zone split 
and worked in external MIDI mode as well. But that you're right, that, that it's hard to find something at an affordable price. Maybe somebody in the chat room might mention something. I'm sure uh, they possibly could. And obviously what a lot of people are doing is, you know, routing it via the computer and using things like uh, Ableton Racks. Uh, instrument racks, which I've also discovered in the last day or so with this visit from Tom, are incredibly powerful, and I did not know you could do that kind of stuff with. So if that's involved in your setup somewhere, explore those. Or, or stay tuned for our videos, and we'll check those out. Mark, can I just you, say, yeah, can I answer that as well? Yes, of course. Does it have to have USB MIDI on it? Or I'm not it sure that's essential. Well, MIDI. either I guess either really. So Digital Music Core MX8 is the thing that I used to use all the time. Uh, it's got eight MIDI inputs and eight MIDI outputs, and you can route anything anywhere. So any keyboard, if you turn all your master uh, or your keyboards to uh, local off, all of them become master keyboards for any of the other things that make sound, and you can break it up into zones, like loads and loads of zones. So you can, yeah, I mean, for, for Nick, I used to swap which keyboards is. played which keys. Ah. Uh, so it, it, he would have, he'd be playing the Elysis keyboard, but he'd be, it would actually be playing the Jupiter 8. So then some songs he didn't have time to turn around, so we just made it so he patched it and it jumped. And, it, you know, you you have whichever's most convenient to play on in front of you so you've got the right keyboards in front of you. It's like virtually swinging the keyboards round and round, if that makes sense. Um, and you can do whatever splits you want. Yeah, I mean, it's that's very old, and whether you can get yeah, one or not yeah. now, that's a whole other but thing. But hard, I mean, this is, and, and the, I guess the thing about the hardware is if you find a keyboard that you like the feel of, it means you don't have to worry about, you know, that. And yes. it, but but he's absolutely right. I mean, Tom Gladstone, you are absolutely right. It is quite hard to find current affordable splits and layer setups. And I think that's partly due to the fact that, you know, a keypad and, you know, some controllers is relatively, and a bunch of pads is kind of relatively easy to design an OS and some processing for. As soon as you start introducing this kind of additional factors in it, it's probably just because it, it's more complex as a GUI and as an operating system. And people are maybe thinking, well, there's not enough people who need that in a standalone scenario. So you might have to look to external hardware. But it's a very good question, I must say. So, yeah, I, I mean, and if anyone's got any suggestions, I'll, I'll, I'll check the show notes and we'll have a look at uh, the... Uh, oh, what's it? Hold on, no. Innovation Impulse has zones, apparently. That, again, I think that's... I'm not sure if that's a current model, but the Impulse is worth checking out. So, yeah, there are things out there, but they're, they're not as uh, as prevalent as you might imagine. And I wonder if that's possible because when people are playing live, they're not generally just playing giant MIDI rigs with, you know, with no computer involved. And I guess that's probably part of the uh, reason for that. Um, okay, well, we had a couple of more general questions because I started to kind of build a library of sort of evergreen topics as I knew the summer was coming. And, you know, quite often there isn't all that much news going on, uh, to be fair. Uh, I don't know if you saw this guy. This was the... Uh, uh, I saw this on, again, Pro, Pro, uh, Pro Tools Expert. And this is a new, quite affordable Sonnet uh, single... Uh, well, it looks like a dual PCI slot. It seems like it's designed for graphics cards, but it's a Thunderbolt kind of super graphics card external box that you could use with, you know, MacBooks and what have you. I guess it would give you a lot of extra processing. And I think it's only, uh, well, I say only, but it's affordable in the sense, where did, what did they say it was? Uh, MSRP of, uh, it's 299 which is 350 550 uh, is going to be a bit more, and I think that's got a little more in that sense of it. I don't know, has anybody got any experience of using these kind of external PCI chassis? I don't. Ah, I thought you gestured yeah. there, but you just reached to scratch yeah, an itch. But I, but I, I, I do have experience with those. Um, yeah, because I, I, I was on Pro Tools uh, HD, the um, the TDM version for a long time, and then I changed computers. I went to the uh, the Mac trash can version, and that obviously doesn't have PCI slots, and so I switched over to all U8, uh, yeah, Universal Audio stuff. So the Apollo series, the 16s and stuff. And, um, but I still, I'd love to be able to access the, uh, those old, uh, cause I still have the PCI cards, you know, <laughs> so, and I still have my, my TDM interfaces and stuff like that. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to be able to access all that stuff. And, and this is, this is affordable because the, the, the other ones that I saw, I think they were about starting about seven or 800 pounds, something like that. So this is, this is definitely, uh, yeah, definitely it right seems direction. finally, I wonder if they, I mean, I know we did kind of go on quite a lot at length about uh the the new thunderbolt uh um 
kind of uh, affordability license free. Maybe this is a, one of the benefits because, you know, they're not having to pay that additional license. But I can't imagine it's three or four hundred dollars. But there you go. Maybe that's part of the deal. Mark, what about you? I mean, you, presumably you you were running more PCI based system when you were doing the rigs for. Uh, um, we were. Duran. No external I don't, know, don't even know where they are now. I know they didn't sell it because I tried to trade it in for something and they insisted on keeping it, which was probably sensible thinking about it. But um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Could be or useful. Goods. I just thought Could I'd be mention useful. it because it was a useful yeah. thing. And as I said, it's a slow, it's a snow you, slow news time of year. Okay. How so much is it? Uh, I think it's 299 US for a single slot and uh, the dual slot is 349, I think that's okay. what it looks like. And that's going to be at, uh, oh, I can't find where it is at the moment. Um, how often? So, okay, here's a couple more to- general topics. Right. So, what? let's start with what is it that gets you excited about new technology? Is there a kind of like checklist of things you think, oh, that is something that I'm really interested in because, I mean, do you kind of, are there things that kind of, press your buttons and you get you get that you know that series you know we've all had uh, gas gear acquisition syndrome when you start thinking about it and then you start kind of uh, extemporizing about how you could possibly use it in your system and how it could possibly make your life better and then you start to justify why you possibly need one I mean what are the things that trigger that process for you and I'll start with you Mark because uh, I imagine being a shop owner it must happen quite regularly and <laughs> hopefully you don't buy all of your stock or at least not sell it so that you can at least hang on to it I had some, uh, I'll go slightly sideways, I had some coaching from a guy who was helping me with sales and what we've worked out is that for the last year, the only reason I don't sell much stuff is because I'm very good at not selling things. So I'm very attached to some of the things in my shop and people go, how much is this? And I go, "Uh, uh, yeah, that one's, um, oh, I'm just in the middle. Um, uh." So So you you don't sell it. So I do get very attached to everything and I haven't learned not to yet. What excites me about new technology? Um, I don't know. I'm excited by this Roly thing at the moment, and I'm trying to decide whether I can justify buying one. So I, I am going through that process of thinking, right, okay, I need to fit it on a guitar. So if I can stick it on a guitar, then I can start to justify owning one. But you can't. And you then, then can't sell it on or send it back if it doesn't work out because it's going to have junk. True. Or I have a that, Velcro all over the bottom of it. Yeah, yeah, but that Velcro, have you tried that Velcro? I've, I used it on some of my stuff, and quite often we use this powerful Velcro to stick things to things for our live rigs and stuff. And, and more often than not, the thing falls apart before the Velcro can come off. Yes. You know, it's more glue, the glue is more powerful, so you have to be really careful with that stuff. It has to be a fairly permanent fixture or something you can I, live without when you've broken it trying to get it off. I Velcroed my Mac Mini into a, a flight case and I had to buy a new, you know, the bit that screws on the bottom. It just completely demolished that when I tried to take it out. It was having none of it. And um, <laughs> and that metal thing's just like not really a, the same shape anymore. So I had to buy another one. But um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I picture how I'm going to look while I'm using it. I right. want to know what it feels like. So things that have a tactile element always are more uh, interesting for me. And I want to know uh, what differentiates it from other things. So if it does something really clearly very different, so this roly thing, I don't have anything that can do that little slidey thing. And I'm rubbish as a keyboard player. And the whole idea of polyphonic aftertouch, I, I mean, I know, is it Dave loves polyphonic after? I have no control over that stuff at all. And I just switch off because it annoys me. Right. But if I have aftertouch, I think it's some, it is after touch on a fader, isn't it, almost, or something like that. And I can see where my finger is, and I've got well, some Well, it's, it's not after touch, it's another. You've got, pre, you've got velocity, yeah. pressure, X, Y, uh, as well, and release velocity. So it's but very, I could map it in the same way that I could map polyphonic yeah. after touch. So it's a, it's a polyphonic expression thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's so, right, yeah. I mean, I can, I, can, I can imagine myself using that and making it work, and I can think of ways that I could use it in my current setup to so you it, you're it the needs to the, fit somewhere so i've got physical enough a small physical space that i work in so it needs to there needs to be a gap for it so something else has to go maybe ah uh, okay um well that's interesting so I, I mean i think all those things and then most important does it squeak when it comes out the box oh uh, really and is that is that in it it's, what it should or it shouldn't no it should be in like polystyrene you know when you open it it should be in a thick cardboard box that's really quite you cut it open and and it feels sturdy and then you reach in and it goes 
as you bring it out. Their packaging is really and nice. And then you're it's like completely waxy. overwhelmed with that totally addictive new packaging smell. Okay, you well, that, that smell. I can concur that their packaging is very good. So, okay, ah. Charles, let's move on to you. So, <laughs> we, we briefly talked about this because we talked, you, you'd seen the analog solutions and you'd kind of said, I can't buy any more synths, but I'm really seriously thinking about this one. So, I, and I said, oh, well, this might be a topic for, for the show. So, yeah. as part of the inspiration for having it in there. So, I wonder what, what are the things that kind of trigger that for you um there are utility things so anything that would make my job a lot easier so anything that's sort of transparent like you know uh maybe a better monitor router or something like that it, anything that will just like not in get in the way of me making music and then i think okay well if i buy this piece of kit will it will it help me to better realize the the musical ideas that i have right and if and if it will, yeah, I, I have no problem spending money on it. Um, if it's if I mean there there are cool toys and things that are for having fun, but you know I, I I it really it has to be there has to be a, a reason for it. And I do look at actually from a business perspective because partly because I, I make money from writing music. Um, I think will this contribute to my income? Do you have in the back of your head this little sort of. Uh unofficial spreadsheet of how of how much each piece of kit has, has uh, justified it, that purchase and now so you feel that next time yes my, I can trust my instincts if I buy this I'm pretty sure it'll pay for itself yes yeah <laughs> and, and I, I've, I've only I've only made a few mistakes in the past you know bought something I thought was really cool and then I ended up never using it but that's that's pretty rare I'm, I'm actually really good about picking things that I know I will use and that I will I will get the most of the, the one weakness that I have, though, is microphones because I've got like 70-something microphones right now. Right. And, and it's just like, <laughs> don't, don't need. But the thing is, you know, mic companies keep sending me mics, so that, that, that helps a lot. But, um, but I, I, I need to not buy any more microphones because I've got, I've got all I need. Got enough. And, I've, I've and the thing is, if you've got that many, you're going to forget which is good for what and you just remember the last thing you used on it that sounded all right rather than, oh, that needs a, you know, uh, yeah. this this variant of one of the three of this kind of microphone i've got right <laughs> that's right that's absolutely right um you know I, my next big purchase by the way uh is uh, i'm gonna buy another console <laughs> whoa okay well that is a big that's a big decision and it's what it's one of the reasons i'm touring all summer and touring in the autumn too because i got <laughs> gotta pay for it you know yeah, yeah, so yeah. i don't know how i'm gonna get it in here it's gonna have to bring a crane and lift it up over the house because oh, that no, kind of console right okay it's, yeah it, it, uh, it's about almost double the size of this one so Shoot. uh yeah i mean it's one of the big audience i'm gonna get one of the big audience consoles because i'm doing i'm doing a movie project next year and i need to i need to have a console that i can leave on all the time because this thing i love it i love the sound of it but my electricity bill is so high with that thing on it's full it's, of valves right yeah so my normal electricity bill is about 300 and something a quarter and when that's on uh, it goes up to about 1500 a quarter right so i just i gotta I get, so in a couple of years you'll have paid for it ah, no problem <laughs> exactly. at all. even just on but, electricity that's right exactly that's interesting i okay. was thinking big i was thinking about when i went and got a demo of the console i asked the guy like okay so what is its power consumption and and we we looked it up and i was calculating my head okay so that means i could leave it on or, you know, because it consumes about 300 and something watts. This thing consumes 1,200 watts, you know. <laughs> that's, <laughs> so, like a, that's like a fan heater. It, it, you know what? A, it, a kettle. Fact, <laughs> I can't run it during the summer because it will get so hot in here, even though this whole wall over here is all, all it opens up completely. With that open up completely, it's still too hot in here. This thing, it's just So like, you're saving again because you don't have to switch the air conditioning on. That's an exactly. interesting... Okay, well, that's interesting. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad for that extra insight. I was thinking about this today, actually, and I was thinking probably first, uh, or at least if it's a sound generation thing, first it's the sound. If the sound makes me kind of... That will start my interest. It's like, wow, that sounds great. Then I start thinking about the GUI because sometimes it's not always about the sound. Like the sledge, I really like the sledge because I love the GUI. I think it's a brilliant, or the user interface. I think the size and the scale of it almost warrants a purchase because it's such a nice big thing to to perform synthesis and sound design on. You know the the, the way you interact with it. And then finally, it's the functions. You know, or in order, if it doesn't sound great, then if the GUI is great, it might do it. And if neither of those, it might do something very specific that, like you say, Charles, that it will enhance or help me do what i need to do and that's i, I can tend to apply that to all of this stuff behind me and 
And very often the problem is, whether you're in video, is, uh, yeah, I could buy something that made the whole thing easier, but it would be so expensive that I actually have to figure out a cheaper way of doing it with less expensive components that can achieve the same kind of thing and the same patchability. So it's a different process for that because it's not about the sound. Uh, uh, it's, mo it's more about function in that scenario because I'm trying to make video affordable and stuff that we can operate with the minimum number of people and, you know, continue to do what we do. But in terms of musical instrument stuff, it's the sound, you know, and it's like, well, I need this. But, uh, I mean, that was the thing that with the circuit, it was the function and the GUI that did it for me. The sound is great, and the synth engine in that is actually really good. That's probably the last sound generation thing I actually bought. And, and the sound is actually pretty good. It's just not much fun to program from the front panel. You have to get into an editor and whatever, which is fine. But in terms of performing live, the way that it's so easy to use ongoing and just you know you can very quickly kind of master it and utilize it. And that's why I bought that because it's like, yes, this is going to help make my live life simpler and in some right. ways it has and in some ways it hasn't so yeah but it's an interesting so if, sorry Mark. So if something had like one tiny function on it um and it did loads of other things that you didn't need but it did that one thing you would buy that even though it didn't no it would have to justify no. itself a bit better than that i mean because yeah. some people will buy you know studio equipment for it's like you know some people buy the i don't know whatever it is some vintage uh, h9000 or what whatever it may be just one, one just that one something. sound you know yeah. and I, I don't think i'd do that because I that becomes that too either. expensive i mean you know i mean yes i wouldn't say no but that's the sort of thing that you could put up with an emulation because it's not like you're going to be tweaking it the whole time so the gui is not really important in that case it's the sound so you might use a uad plugin or a software you know, emulation in its place right yeah, i just realized something well, else i do actually which is probably not a good thing i get driven by um I I, st I work out what my rack mount is going to be for my studio or for my live thing, and I don't do live things very often. Or or for my, I'm going to rock up with all this gear that is my speciality, and I make these weird noises with this, and it's always based on whichever flight case I've decided is the appropriate one for that time. So I just acquired a very shallow, sixteen unit rack, I think. And now I'm uh, evaluating all my gear based on whether or not whether it's it shallow enough that. to go in the rack. <laughs> so I've well, got that's, this that's, TC that's Helicon what... VoiceWorks Plus thing up here, and I've measured it, and it's 20 millimeters too deep. And I'm like going, right, that's got to go. But actually, it's so brilliant, I don't want to get rid of it. Well, couldn't so. you just get a larger rear lid or front lid so that it's stuck out a bit further at the back? No, it's a mixer case rack, you know, one of those ones right. that flipped up. So I've yeah. got this notion that I'll stick my Mac Mini in there with a USB screen, but touch screen maybe. So I'll flip it up and then I'll be able to, you know. But I, I just need to rethink it and maybe have two racks. Can I show you something else as well? Okay, go ahead. You're probably not going to see this. Can you see this? Yeah, it's Perspex. It looks like some kind of... Uh, this makes a noise, isn't it? Oh, that's cool. Ooh. Can you hear that? Oh, it's like... Um, Oh, yeah, I see. So it's not Perspex. It's, uh, it's a banding. A, it's a, a band. It looks like a sword, and it's got these kind of rubber bands around it. And I, I was walking down Glastonbury High Street, and there was this chap walking along with this, and he'd got it like a walking stick. And I bowled up to him, and I was like, excuse me, what on earth is that? And he waved it, and it made this noise. So I was so wowed by it, the fact that he'd got this kind of sword-like walking stick that you made him. noise. That, um, well, I, no, I didn't like <laughs> No, but I bought a few off him because I think they're really cool and he's making them in Glastonbury. So, and it makes, and I can't play the didgeridoo and it goes. So you can do that overblown kind of didgeridoo sound. So that was completely based on the sound it makes. I can't do circular breathing, but I can make something like a bull roarer kind of didgeridoo sound. And then I can do. That's really quite loud, isn't it? That's, yeah, that's... it's very cool. Very, very cool. And they're about 25 quid. So What's it called and where'd you get them? It's called an Omwand, O-M-W-A-N-D, Wind what? Singer. Uh, you can buy them from his website, which is windsinger.com. Or you could come to Glastonbury. I think he's currently making them in, in some... Uh, guy's house around the corner he's Ooh. making a thousand of them at the moment with a plan to go to the festival with them yeah that's it can you tune them yes oh that's really stereo it's he's cool, been recording it? that with binaural mics by the sound of it so and but you can also tune an interval so they um so if you have one band 
tune the other to to a different uh, note to the you other band. Chords. I can make one side tight and the other side loose, and I can go a fo- probably a fourth, a third, or a fourth. I, I'm not sure if I can get it to go to a fifth interval difference, and it will play a sort of a rudimentary two note chord. Oh, neat! But then if you have two of them and start swinging them about with, you can make all sorts of weird chords up with four different notes. And then you could put some fire on the end and juggle with them. You could get the whole, the whole hippie live experience going on there. Then you take off your shoes for at least a month so that you're trying And stripy trousers, right? Stripy trousers. good coloured. (laughs) <laughs> no, that sounds really good. Nice find. Nice find. Uh, yeah. spe- speaking of nice finds, uh, I found uh, a backup service because I I used to use uh, Carbonite, which is fine, and it, I've just can't, it was like starting to get really expensive, and I hadn't backed this thing up, so I started looking, and I found this uh, company called Blackblaze, uh, Blackblaze dot com, and they do you know you could get an unlimited single computer license, unlimited data. So I happened to have, uh, when I set it up, I thought, I'll try it out, see how fast it backs. So I backed up all my stuff. I got five days. I was like, yeah, okay. And it tried to back up the uh, hard drive that was attached with all my live recordings and stuff on it. And it was like, hmm, okay. So it will back up external stuff as well, all to the cloud. And I think you can get, it's like five bucks a month, uh, 50 bucks for a year if you go that way. And it's just, you know, it's installs a little utility you can throttle the network pause it all of that sort of stuff and i just thought that's a pretty good price for that kind of thing it seems to be one of the cheaper ones that i got so and i made a little uh a url which means i'll get discount <laughs> if you go and order it which is uh, bitly slash bb sonic uh black blaze sonic so bb sonic uh, if you want to check that out but it's actually quite it's quite seamless once you've done it all it you can schedule it so it does it overnight when it's off and it just basically if you s- stick another drive on you can go well i need to back this up as well it's quite nifty i don't know if anyone else uses cloud stuff i don't know if you do charles i, I dropbox i use right. dropbox all the time that's expensive though but it's useful for sharing stuff obviously but yeah it's i mean i have to because all my all my clients have dropbox all of them um and so but you have yeah, to so, phys- you have to physically back that or you have to work in the dropbox folder well, like when i whenever i like I, i'll have you know obviously a, a file for each for each client and then say you know when they were here for example uh we we're running off mixes i'll I'll b- actually bounce the mix directly to the Dropbox folder, and they, you yeah, know, me too. They go, oh, okay, well, the day's over, so I go home. So they go home, and it's uh, it's on their computer <laughs> when they get back. Yeah. It is it is the pretty only, handy. The only problem with that is that the moment one of your clients moves it, it moves for everybody else, doesn't it? Uh, no, only if I created the folder, it's only if I move it. Right. Um, they, oh, that's they true. just they just lose the link. That's all. Yeah. But actually, we use Dropbox here. Um, we've got a remote reviewer who does uh, work. How do you do on, that? Works on stuff, and he just basically says it's all in there, and then I can get hold of the project. And if I've saved any additional edits, it goes in there, and then he can go, yeah, I'll just tidy that up. And that works really well for collaboration. Um, although I think there was some issue with. Sometimes if you run the project live with all the assets off a Dropbox folder, it can get, and there's somebody else tweaking something, it can does go a bit weird, yeah. Things up a bit, so yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, that's I've why not- I won't run a session out of it at all. No, it's right. only for things I bounce down. Right. I mean, I run, I run sessions out of it, and I've noticed that other people go in there and move stuff around, and it all just breaks. Or they can, if they drag it out of Dropbox at their end, so they drag it out and put it in their music folder or something, it just disappears for everyone else. So Yeah, or the other thing is if you've got a shared folder and you don't remember and you go to America, say, for instance, and you're using cellular data and your computer starts going, oh, yeah, there's another 12 gigs I need to download and you don't realise what's going on. Those are the sort of things. <laughs> it, they could do with a little bit more kind of sensible system-level rules. So it says if I'm on mobile data or my bandwidth is less than something, just don't touch it or if my location changes leave it alone you know because you, you don't always yeah. remember and we've done that when i've done that when i've been in uh, in the states in a hotel room just kind of you know at nam or whatever and i've got a hell of a lot on my mind and remembering to pause the the dropbox is probably the last thing i do and then i go ouch you know and i wanted all that bandwidth for uploading actual video that i might be you know putting live or whatever so you've got to be careful with that sort of thing so yeah so, this, yeah. um, for, you know, for doing back. the sessions and stuff like that, though, I, it, I'd go, you know, Gobbler is kind of a, a good way to go. Yeah. Collaborative stuff. Oh, that but. broke on my computer as well. I didn't get on very well with that. Kept, yeah, I mean, kept. I, honestly, I don't use it, honestly. I mean, I, 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 never, I never really have anybody who wants to collaborate. You know? Yeah, right. we use uh, Gobbler just slowed my computer down suddenly, and I think it was doing something where it was um, indexing, clashing. Indexes, yeah, but it? it was clashing with some other system because I had Dropbox 
OneDrive, iCloud and Gobbler <laughs> all on the same computer. And then Gobbler seemed to be the one that was making everything go wrong. So I had to remove it. Uh, um, well, maybe it's just a configuration. Uh, also mentioned in the chat room was Splice. We used that, didn't we, Mark, to collaborate yeah. on some... Uh, uh, some stuff. I've that, that on there as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I've I've uh, turned that off because I'm not really using it so much. But I mean, that, all of these systems, you know, it's just kind of finding the right one. But I just thought I'd mention this because it's just a pure backup thing. It's not a sharing thing, and it's actually quite a reasonable price for up what is essentially unlimited data. So, so you can of, put so I could put like ten terabytes on here, and it would be happy, would it? Well, it it seems to uh, it says unlimited. I mean, I haven't tested it. I've I've done, I've just done sixty gigs, and there's another five hundred gigs on the external drive. It's or it's five hundred, and it was it was just saying, do you want me to do this? It's like, no, no, I don't want you to do that. That's fine. But I mean, I could do if I wanted. Oh wow! Well. So, so yeah, mm. it's kind of neat. Anyway, I think that probably brings us to the end of the procedures. We've uh, managed to fill an awful lot of time. I want to say thank you very much to all our uh, viewers. Thank you very much to all of you guys and gals in the YouTube chat room. Uh, do a wave. We'll do a little hello, everybody, and also maybe one for our uh, other our IRC chat room as well. And also want to say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, don't forget, if you want to enter the Isotope RX competition, what you have to do is tweet the hashtag restore and more. Uh, and the hashtag RX6 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. And that will get you entered for the competition next week where the winner will win a copy of RX. I think it's standard, actually, but it's still really, really useful for uh, music production. It's just sort of some of the more esoteric video style stuff that you may or may not uh, require in your productions. You know, it's anyway... It's a great deal because it's free. What else can I say? And I want to say also thank you to... Um, uh, so, yeah, thanks to Simon Forsyth for the Cincy event, and, and uh, I very much enjoy myself. And don't forget, Kimberly Beats is on Saturday at, this Saturday, the 17th of June. We'll be down there filming and we'll be streaming. Uh, that's the Chapter Art Centre. If you go to uh, kimrybeats.com, that's C-Y-M-R-U-B-E-A-T-S.com, that'll get, you can get tickets and what have you, and it's going to be a fun event. And if you want to see Mylar Menides uh, perform, who's a great... Uh, a great asset to the modular community, well worth it, and several other people too. So, chaps, Mark Tinley, thank you very much for joining us. Sonus Magus, uh, obviously, you got all of that stuff. You could go and buy wind twangers and all of this kind of business, or wind singer, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think wing twanger sounds better, actually, but, you know, perhaps a bit, a bit less, uh, a, a not suitable for work, perhaps. But go and check out what Mark's doing, and uh, I wish you every luck with your uh, Glastonbury weekend, which is going to be. Uh, and I hope the weather stays good because I'd imagine you'll be looking out at all these sort of bedraggled people feeling feeling smug in your dryness, perhaps. Maybe. Well, not, yeah, on Sunday. Hopefully it stays good on the Sunday. Yeah. Um, I, I, what am I meant to say now? I've got. I, th I thought you were. I, I thought like you were about to say. Can I just? Can started, I just? Can I just I mention something? But I uh, had no idea how to say goodbye. <laughs> that's all right. You could just say goodbye. Thank you very much, Mark. It's been goodbye. a pleasure. <laughs> and also, Mr. Charles Chicky Reeves, uh, thank you for joining us. I know you're very busy today, and you're heading off and production rehearsals. Very much appreciate. And as I say, lovely to meet you. On, it was uh, great meeting you too. on Sunday, and, and it was great uh, hearing you perform. Thank you. Really that's very was. kind. Uh, um, I, I, as you know, I'm a big fan of your music. So. Well, I uh, I intend to perhaps uh, try and take you up on some of your kind offers to have a look at some of that, and I'm going to uh, I, I'll be in touch. I okay. promise. That sounds anyway, great. Anyway, that's it for this week. See you later. See you, Charles. See you, Mark. And we'll see you uh, next cheerio. time. That, yes, cheerio. Thank you, Mark. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Uh, right, and that's it for this week. That is Sonic Talk episode 495. Don't forget to subscribe if this is the sort of thing that floats your boat. We do lots of content, and it's all jolly good fun. See you later.